Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrei Smirnov. Uh, I work at the Broad Institute uh, developing JDK, and my main focus is uh, carbon number variation. So if uh, anyone is uh, interested in doing copy number, copy number variant analysis, then come talk to me. But uh, right now, uh, I will talk about uh, library preparation and sequencing. So this is um, so this is stuff that happens before actually variant analysis. And um, for the rest of the workshop, we will basically going through in more details about everything else that happens afterwards. The, uh, the, the mapping, the um, post-processing, and then var variant calling. However, it is important to describe what actually happens in the uh, sequencing part of the workflow to understand where the data comes from and what are the pitfalls and what are the possible error modes. Um, and what we should expect from our data and what are the different data types um, that we will have to be dealing with. So first comes the library preparation, actually uh, getting the DNA sample from a person and turning it into something that we can put on a sequencer. And the way it's done is well, first the sample is extracted in one way or another, whether it's from saliva, blood, or tissue. Um, if your um, interest is in RNA, then uh, you will have to use process called reverse transcriptase PCR to turn it into DNA because that's what actually sequencing sequencers are capable of reading. Once you have that, uh, we will shear the DNA into, we will fragment it into a lot of different pieces that have a uh, length size between maybe like 300 bases to a kilobase and there's a distribution over that size. Um, and here were major uh, choices to be made, whether you want to sequence your entire genome or whether you want to sequence only part of it. So if you're not interested in sequencing the entire genome, you can only focus, for example, on, egg, on exonic regions. And then you, there's a process to um, actually pick those fragments that belong to the, uh, only to exons that we will talk about later. So now that we have all the fragments that of your interest, uh, we will add the adapters that are used, uh, that we will see how are used for uh, actually sequencing uh, on Illumina sequencers. And once we have the, the fragments with adapters in them, we will use PCR to uh, actually amplify our material to uh, have more stuff to sequence. Okay, so now we have the library. Now we can put it in a sequencer and uh, get some results. So the way that the, uh, the sequencing works, the way it looks like is you put the, the library onto the small flow cell that is about that size, and that flow cell has uh, a few different lanes. And the idea behind the lanes is to, well, to basically parallelize the process to have more output. And those lanes are, uh, in a way, they're independent of each other. So the, the chemicals, they don't in, in, interact between one lane and another. Um, and each lane has a lot of uh, small um, uh, little clusters that are formed on the bottom of it. And that's where the, our little fragments attach. Remember, we put the adapters to the uh, end of each fragment, and the, on, and, and the bottom of each flow cell has complementary adapters that our fragments will attach to. And once they're attached, we will also amplify them uh, 
with a process called bridge amplification. And the reason we do that is so that the signal that we get once we read off our basis, it, we want it to be stronger, right? So if, yes? Um, so the PCR amplification before was to increase this, uh, the, just the library size. But here we actually want to, so we will read off the signal in the, as just like some light signal based on the dyes in our basis. And we want there to be more light. That's the only reason. And we want th that light to be concentrated in, the one, in one small area, right? Um, okay, so now that uh, we have that, we will start adding bases. Uh, we add, uh, we f through the lane, we flush the bases with dyes and this little, uh, uh, and, and the bases have the property that other bases will not attach to them. So they have like these little uh, modifications that do not allow the next base that comes in to be attached to the next one. And so once we do that, we can take a snapshot of the, f of the flow cell at that particular point of time, and then we get this picture, and then given this picture, we can actually say, oh, okay, in, that, in, in this place, the next base is C or A, and so on. Um, and so the output, basically, the very raw output of a sequencer is the sequence of those pictures taken one after another. Um, and uh, let's see what else I should talk about. Um, there's an option to have multiple se sample sequence on the same um, on the same lane, and the way we make sure that we actually know which read came from which sequence is we add we index the we add a barcode to each each each, each fragment to identify which sample it came from. Um, Okay, so at the end we get this enormous pile of read, and by enormous I mean each each lane of the flow cell produces about one to ten billions of of reads. And the uh, the way it looks like is usually comes in the FASTQ format, which is just a text file with one line uh, of text for each corresponding to each read, and that line of text has three main fields. One is sequence name, which will identify the read name, the read group, uh, or what, what lane, uh, you'll identify what lane the read came from, uh, and also the, the sample name. Then it has the sequence, uh, the sequence uh, information, so you will see all the bases that was read uh, from that particular read. And finally, you have quality scores in, uh, uh, in Fred scale uh, values encoded with ASCII characters. So that's, the, those are the, these characters right here on the bottom. So each sequence letter corresponds to a quality score right here. Uh, and the way the, 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 the quality score is represented is in this Fred scale value with, uh, Basically, if we are 90% sure in our call, then um, we put uh, zero 09 in this little formula and we get out a uh, quality score of 10. If you're 99% sure, we'll get quality score of 20. 99% sure, we get quality uh, score of 30. So it has a very uh, pretty logarithmic scaling. And basically, everything uh, that's above 20. It's, it's, it's a pretty good score and we're pretty uh, happy to use it in the analysis. Um, so now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, what are the different types of the data that uh, we generate. And in our pipelines, we differentiate two main types two main types and then we actually apply different methods to it. Um, 
One of them is whole genome sequencing, where we, uh, we sequence the entire genome. We do not have any uh, fragment selection procedure, and just everything that we extract from our DNA, we sequence. The other one, the other type is exome sequencing, where we actually only try to sequence the, uh, the areas of genome that are coded. So just the exonic regions. Uh, and well, you can also, if you have a, a specific subset of genes in mind, you can, you can only sequence those and then you would be a gene panel. Um, and so the difference here is that uh, you will see different regions sequenced in your actual output. So you, for example, the introns, you will not have any reads covering those regions. Or maybe you'll get a few because, uh, because your uh, fragment selection process uh, picked them up um, somehow, but mo more or less you'll only get uh, reads in regions of your interest, ideally. And in whole genome sequencing, you will get uh, reads, well, everywhere, unless those um, but specific regions are hard to sequence or hard to map. And this is what it looks like. This is what the real data looks like in uh, uh, integra uh, IGV, the integrated genomic fever. Has anyone ever used it before? Cool. Um, so for those who have not, uh, every gray bar over here represents one single read. And um, you can see, what, based on its orientation, it's a little arrow, what part of the, uh, whether it was, because we sequence pair reads, which, which, which of the pair that read belongs to. And on top, you have the whole genome sequencing, that uh, sample that I described before. And on the bottom, we have the whole exome sequencing. Um, of the bed, you see, so right here, these two tracks are the coverage. So each point represents the depth of coverage at that particular loci. And you can see that um, the coverage on the, of the whole genome sample is more or less, it's more or less uniform. Um, and in the whole exome sequence, sequencing, the coverage it's centered around the area which we're trying to sequence and then it falls off as we move outside of it. Uh, a few other things to point out about this is, uh, so this is the reference track, right? This is the reference that we align our reads to that we will talk about in more detail uh, later. And you can see right here in this little, little dots, are the bases that uh, misalign to the reference. And because this is, so there's like a lot of them sprinkled around and well, probably they're just artifacts. We don't believe that these are somehow actually real bases. And probably if you look at them, you will see that their quality scores, uh, sh they should be pretty low. Um, now we do have an example of a, of a mutation here. Uh, and so this is an indel, and you can see that it occurs uh, in roughly, well, roughly half of the reads if you, uh, you don't see all of them here, but in roughly half of the reads. So, uh, so this is a heterozygous variant and half of the reads, half of the uh, reads came from the chromosome that came from your mom, half of the uh, reads came from a chromosome from your dad. So you expect roughly 50% of the reads to represent your variant. And so you see it clearly in the whole genome sequencing, right? You, you have, uh, well, very little doubt that there's a, this is a real variant. However, for whole, sorry, for whole genome sequencing, however, for small exome sequencing, you have one tiny little read right here, and well, you really don't want to trust it. So you cannot really infer this variant from 
from this data type. However, for, um, for the area which the whole exome sequencing was designed for, uh, for this, oh, this is by the way on the bottom, this is a gene track, and this, and this is the, this is uh, an actual exonic area, and this is an intron. And so for here, you can see that both data types are perfectly good for calling this little SNP right here, which you can see right by the little orange, orange dots. Okay. So the whole exome sequencing also comes in different shapes and the, um, the way usually it is designed is by designing these bait sets and the bait sets supposed to uh, uh, be complementary to the regions that we are trying to sequence. And some bait set sets are better than others or they're designed to capture certain areas better than others. And so different kits will have different affinities to capture different regions of genome. As you can see here, uh, we are, have easy time capturing this particular exome, but not this area right here. And then in, in this kit B, uh, we captured this intronic region, but not the exome. So that's one thing to keep in mind when we do uh, analysis on whole exome sequencing that we actually have coverage in different areas. Okay, so now we talk about the potential, potential problems, potential disasters, or just uh, common day things that happen to your sequencing analysis that sh you should be uh, aware of and keep in mind when you going through the pipelines. Um, so one of, the, one of the examples is you just do not have enough coverage for one reason or another, whether you have very little material or something went wrong in the sequencing process, you just do not have enough reads. And uh, well, that is relatively easy to pick up on and there are metrics that we output using uh, the uh, USB card that will show you that information. And so whatever the reason was, you can fix that later on by sequencing more material. Uh, or, or doing something else. Um, another interesting problem that happens is uh, chimerism, like artifact, not actual chimerism where you have some structural variation occurring in your sample and you have true variants, but some artifacts that happen that show sh sh that where the reads look they like they're chimeric. And we will, so chimeric reads are the ones that came sort of from two different places. One came from one chromosome, for example, one came from another. And so on your, in IGV, it will look like uh, part of the read is perfectly line, uh, aligned and then part of the read has, will have a bunch of highlighted bases because aligner wasn't actually sure where to put them. It put them in the region where it thought uh, it fit better, however, half of the read does not fit there. We will, uh, so it will become a little bit more apparent when we look at the, uh, look at the next slide that shows the picture of it. Uh, another problem is uh, strange insert side distribution. We will also uh, look at the example of it. Uh, shearing based oxidation, which happens because when we shear our DNA, when we break it up into little fragments, we use sonic waves, and it's a pretty, pretty intense process, and uh, apparently it oxidizes DNA, and then bad things happen when we sequence it. Uh, and so we also need to be aware of it and collect some kind of metrics that help us quantify it. Uh, and the last one is that library size is too small, and we actually don't have a good representation of of our, of, our, of our sample. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of uh, 
points about the DNA sequencing in general, but now for different data types that we have, we can also have different problems that are specific to those data types. For example, in exome, um, the coverage can be really uneven. So like you, can, you, you saw before that in, in this slide that the coverage is, is, is slightly, well, in, in, in some regions it's slightly more than the others. However, you can have examples where it's really drastic and you wanna also keep track of that. Uh, then you also have reference bias where you're, um, um, let's see, where you have uh, more, um, you have more regions, um, um, well, yeah, basically it's, it, 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 it's also related to the unevenness because of the way that the baits are designed. Um, and the, um, the whole genomes comes with another set of pitfalls. For example, the uh, high proportion of unmapped breeds because certain areas will have uh, lower complexity than the others. And it's more apparent in, in whole genome sequencing because uh, we have, well, we have a lot of areas where um, we have STR repeats and so they have very low complexity and we won't be able to perfectly map reads in those regions. Uh, and some other is high percentage of uh, adapter sequencing in the actual, in actual reads, and we can also uh, pick that up before we actually process our samples and make sure that we um, do not tank our analysis. Okay. Um, so one factor, for example, that interferes with uh, the distribution of, that affects the distribution of the reads is the GC contact content of any particular region. So because uh, so G the G GC uh, uh, bond in, in our DNA is, 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 is stronger than, than AT, then when we, when we separate uh, our double-stranded DNA, it requires more energy in the places where you have the more GC bonds than ATs, and so you will have different, 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 uh, different affinities of, uh, for example, sequencing regions with very high GC content. Uh, and so that will, that will be one of your covariates of how much coverage you have in one particular area. And so that's something that's something to be aware of, definitely. For example, when we're doing um, copy number variation analysis, because we, those are coverage-based tools and we really care about where that coverage comes from, we wanna make sure that we have that information when we, uh, when we try to figure out whether the coverage came from the copy number variation where there's duplication of DNA or whether it was just that we have a region with very high GC content and we got more coverage because of that. Um, so it's not just that, so before we talked about that, we wanna make sure that uh, we have enough coverage overall in our genome, but it's also important to, to, that the coverage is more or less uniform. And so besides just the raw number of how many reads we have in, this, in, 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 in our analysis, we also wanna see what is the rough uh, variance of the coverage that we have. And you can see that for different particular kits, um, you will have different, um, uh, different, uh, different variants. And actually the next slide shows us better. Uh, this is actually a whole genome sequencing and you see that um, right here, so this is an example of good sample where the coverage is more or less uniform and on the top you have sample that actually has roughly, average coverage is about the same but there's these huge spikes um, which are not represented in unique coverage but however they are represented in other different metrics we collect that will show you that something went wrong. 
Um, so another thing is that the regroups, the, the uh, read sequence from different lanes of your flow cell, they also might have difference in coverage. And uh, for example, this, this is shown here, and that does happen rarely, and the fix for that is we just take this particular read group and we top it off, and then we resequence it and just add it to the BAM. Um, so this is, was, this is the example of chimerism that I talked about. You can see like these reads are, this is implied that there are lines somewhere else and something really wrong went with library preparation or um, sequencing step and um, yeah, so this is bad. Um, This is an example of the strange insert side distribution that we talked about. Um, and here, uh, there was some bacterial contamination in the, in the DNA uh, of, uh, of the, uh, it was saliva, and, uh, the, and there were some particularly small reeds. Uh, well, they look like small insert sized reeds that are, were aligned to the reference of the human and in the insert side distribution, it looks like this. So we really don't want the spike to be here. We want this distribution to be more or less, more or less um, uh, unimodal. This, uh, I actually not sure. It's, 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 Something, something, something bad. Uh, I believe the, the the slide said something really screwy went here. And <laughs> yeah, these these are from um, kind of a, a the library of, of horrible sequence that uh, that the lab has. That the cases that they've seen um, along the years of just things that went wrong. In some <laughs> cases, we know what went wrong. In some cases, we don't. We just see the symptoms. Um, that particular case, I don't think they ever got an explanation, um, but you can have things that go wrong like during the lab processes that, that cause, um, and it can be like based on the sampling or the sample processing uh, where things go wrong. The next one though, it's kind of a funny story. Yeah. Um, this one was a case where they, it was um, mouth saliva samples from sick children. And basically, they were taking these saliva samples and, and sequencing them. Um, and what they found out was that the bacterial load in the kid's mouth was so big, most of what they were sequencing was just bacteria. Um, it was just the sample was so heavily contaminated with bacteria that that's what mostly what was sequenced. Um, and so these were all like little sequences that are considered to be a bacterial human that were just opportunistically attaching the line to the human reference. That was mostly just bacteria. Um, there are also a few cases that are less dramatic, but where you can see um, animal sequence that contaminates certain samples from people who got sampled after lunch. So they had a hamburger, <laughs> um, and then they, you end up with, with just cow DNA in the sample. And so one of, one of the developers in the group developed the methods to be able to recognize those sequences and eliminate them, kind of extract them from the sample uh, in post-processing. Go ahead. So does it, do you have a tool to detect the contamination from other species? So for that, uh, there's um, a tool called PathSeq. Uh, we're not going to cover it in the workshop, but it is uh, in the documentation. So if you look up PathSeq, I believe there's a blog post about it as well. Um, and uh, basically it explains how you can use that to identify um, contamination by other species and kind of quarantine that data so it doesn't contaminate your results. Because especially, especially DNA from other vertebrates is close enough that it can, in some cases, align and introduce noise um, into your data. So in that particular case, was it possible to throw away the tiny 
Is that super... so, so for that one, the way they dealt with it was to add a new filter um, because the thing that was very characteristic in this case was that every, all of those contaminating reads were soft clips on both ends. So soft clips is when um, the aligner kind of at, at a certain point just gives up and, and just masks some of the sequence of the read. And if you have soft clips on both sides of the read, um, that's usually a, a sign that there's something very wrong with that read. Um, and so in this case, just adding that filter um, just solved the problem. And that filter is now on by default in our production pipeline. About the when you have this cross species contamination, this in the sequencing, uh, obviously when we have a human samples, we try to align the human samples up. But yeah, so yeah, so the the path seek methods um, uses uh, I forget exactly how there's, it works. There's a huge resource, like so. There's a, a reference of a lot of DNA sequencing of other common common contaminants, bacteria, yeah. and so on. Yeah, and you, you use that essentially database um, to compare to, and it's it's basically a metagenomic analysis, and you can actually use it for for pulling out metagenome from uh, like a gut sample or stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so the, I guess the last point to make is that uh, we just need to be aware of those issues, and well, we can deal with them not necessarily by resequencing these samples, but sometimes we just want to throw a sample away from the analysis so that it doesn't mess up everything else, or we want to throw away particular reads so that they don't mess up anything else. And um, yeah, so that was, that was all we are going to discuss about the, the sequencing step. And um, uh, yeah, so we'll start talking about the actual uh, pre-processing.